on behalf of department of hematology i welcome you all for the ccr today we are going to present a case that would be of interest to the generalists the internists and the subspecialists and we have taken a lot of effort in making it as interesting and uh, suspenseful as possible so the title when acid levels attack comes from eosinophils they take up the stain eosin that is acidic in nature and when these cells in the peripheral blood and the hematopoietic system when they run amok they can lead to a variety of multi system complications that can take all your clinical acumen and the lab to put up pinpoint the cause for this so i with this i hand over the rights to dr dipika who is a resident in clinical hematology and uh, dr vandana puri who is a resident in hematopathology together they have put up a very good slide deck for your education as well as interest so dr dipika thank you sir so it's a case of 57 year old gentleman a resident of sohuna gurgaon who was a perfume businessman he presented initially to department of medicine and was admitted from 8th of november to 18th of november uh, under department of medicine subsequently he was referred to our department and he was evaluated and admitted uh, under department of hematology he presented with fever on and off for four months associated with progressive generalized weakness abdominal discomfort and non productive cough for two months his past history was significant he was a known case of diabetes type 2 diabetes which was well controlled on oral hypoglycemic agents personal and family history was not contributory and for evaluation of his symptoms the patient was initially admitted under department of medicine on 8th of november uh during evaluation in his first admission under department of medicine his cbc revealed biocytopenia he had severe anemia hbo4 he had thrombocytopenia with 51000 platelet count and what what was striking was in differential count there were 38% eosinophil and the absolute eosinophil count was more than 2000 so for the evaluation for finding the etiology of this fever and eosinophilia an extensive workup was done including stool examination autoimmune workup and a battery of tests to rule out the infective causes all of which turned out to be negative finally to get to the etiology of eosinophilia a bone marrow examination was done the findings of which will be discussed by my colleague dr vanna subsequently after this the patient was referred to hematology he came to hematology opd on 23rd of november at presentation he had pallor he was icteric there was bilateral pitting, uh, pitting pedal edema he had petechial rash all over the body he had massive hepatosplenomegaly and on examination the air entry was decreased on left infra axillary area with egophony rest of the physical examination was unremarkable so to summarize we had a 47 year old male with past history of well controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus who was symptomatic for 4 months with fever progressive weakness cough and weight loss physical examination was significant for hepatosplenomegaly and left sided pleural effusion lab showed anemia thrombocytopenia there was hypereosinophilia which has increased to 7800 on uh, 23rd 11 and elevated bilirubin was there so based on history and physical examination these were our differential diagnosis out of which most of the differential diagnosis like infectious cause autoimmune causes for eosinophilia solid organ malignancies portal hypertension they were already ruled out by uh, extensive evaluation which was done under department of medicine and what we were left with was some hematological disorder with eosinophilia which was causing all these symptoms at this time a main differential was it could be some myeloproliferative neoplasm like chronic eosinophilic leukemia systemic mastocytosis or cml which can present with uh, eosinophilia in the symptoms 
second differential was acute leukemias uh, acute leukemias like aml with certain translocations like pore binding factor mutation inversion 16 they can present with eosinophilia in aml in fact all who have translocation 514 they can also present with eosinophilias so acute leukemia was also one of our differential diagnosis and the last differential diagnosis which we considered was t cell lymphoma or hodgkin's lymphoma which can cause eosinophilia though eosinophils are not a part of malignant clone they are just uh, reactive to the underlying lymphoma so based on these differential diagnosis we initially did a cbc and biochemical parameter of the patient and compared it with a baseline what was there on initial presentation on 8th of November. So what we found was as compared to the initial pre presentation on 23rd of November within a span of around 15 days he still had severe anemia, anemia his platelet count had dropped further to 12,000 there was a marked increase in TLC count. Now his total leukocyte count was around 72,000 and what was striking was now the peripheral smear had 82% blast and his absolute eosinophil count was also increased. Regarding rest of the system, now his renal function had deteriorated, his bilirubin had increased uh, and his albumin had decreased significantly to 1.9. To get to the etiology of this eosinophilia, we, did, we repeated a bone marrow biopsy the findings of which will be discussed and compared with the baseline uh, bone marrow findings by Dr. Vandana. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, we are so uh, this is the bone marrow which was done in the Department of Medicine at the time of presentation on 11th of November. The uh, smear had bicytopenia, the hemoglobin was 9.5, there was mild shift to the left with eosinophilia and the absolute eosinophil count of 2250. Uh, also the bone marrow was done but before that coming to the peripheral smear, the eosinophils had mild dyspoiesis in the form of decreased lobation and abnormal granularity. Bone marrow aspirate was a dry tap, so bone marrow biopsy was done. Bone marrow biopsy showed the diffuse fibrosis and there were few interstitial blasts. To document the fibrosis, a reticulin stain was done, which showed a great free reticulin fibrosis with foci of collagenization on massive trichrome stain. ILC was also performed and it showed the presence of CV34 positive blasts, which accounted for approximately 10%. There was also increased vascularity, which can be seen by a yellow wire. CD117 stain was also performed which highlighted blast. No cluster of mast cells however was documented. At this point features were suspicious for myeloid neoplasm with eosinophilia and tyrosine kinase fusion. This time now the patient was taken under hematology and the bone marrow was repeated in view of bicytopenia and markedly increased WBC count to 72,000. At this point the peripheral smear is showing you presence of 80% blast However, there were also eosinophils which accounted for 10%. Bone marrow aspirate was done this time which was cellular and again showed presence of blast. The bone marrow biopsy this time showed diffuse effacement of bone marrow biopsy with of intertravicular spaces by blast. However, there was also uh, large areas of streaming and fibrosis and as you can see here with the blue, arrow, uh, blue arrows, there were also eosinophils which could be seen on the bone marrow biopsy. To document fibrosis, again the reticulin and empty stain was done which showed grade 3 fibrosis. Flow cytometry was also done at this time which showed the blast. The red color uh, population here is blast which shows presence of CT33 positive population which is also positive for CT117 and CT34. Therefore, a morphological diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia with bone marrow fibrosis and increased eosinophils and eosinophilic precursor was made and the uh, patient was advised for cytogenetics and genomic studies. Till the time the result of genomic study came up, the patient was started on treatment and this will be discussed by Dr. Deepika. So while waiting for molecular results, we started the treatment. So the ideal treatment of AML is 7 plus 3 induction with cytorabin and donorubicin 
which is the standard of care but because our patient was frail he was initially started on low dose cytorabine for cyto reduction and then when the wbc count decreased to less than 25000 he was shifted on as a cytorabine and venetoclax which is now the standard of care in elderly patients who are frail who are unable to tolerate intensive chemotherapy with 7 plus 3 but what was unusual was uh, that even after giving azacitidine and venetoclax, the blast still persisted on peripheral smear. There was no clearance of blast from the peripheral smear. So, after 10 days of wait, we had finally our uh, genomics report which showed a FIP1L1 PDGFR fusion and we were more than happy to get this fusion report because now we have a targeted therapy for this uh, fusion gene. This is imatinib 400 milligram and this target fusion gene is very sensitive to imatinib. Once we started imatinib at 400 milligram, the blood count started improving, the blast disappeared from peripheral smear. So, after all these reports, our final diagnosis was, it was a myeloid neoplasm with PDGFR FIP1 L1 fusion with myeloid blast crisis with febrile neutropenia, inflama inflammation associated cholestatic jaundice, bilateral exudative pleural effusion, left more than right, mostly sec secondary to disease, uh, possible fungal pneumonia and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, once the patient was started on imatinib, the patient was doing well, his liver function improved, his kidney function improved, his blood counts and constitutional symptoms improved. But mid-treatment, he started developing respiratory distress, which was uh, gradually increasing in size and he uh, developed gross left-sided pleural effusion with shift of mediastinum to the right. So, uh, ICD had to be inserted to relieve the symptoms and now on treatment, this left-sided pleural effusion, we had to know the cause of this effusion and we had three differential diagnoses at that time. First, it could be some infection which was ca causing this effusion. Second was chloroma. AML could have infiltrated the pleura and it was causing that effusion. And third, it could be a part of spectrum of eosinophilic disease which can infiltrate the pleura and can cause effusion. So, for investigation, we first uh, did imaging studies which will be discussed by Dr. Ankit. Good afternoon everyone. So I'll start with the first imaging investigation which was the plain radiograph chest that was performed on 8th November 2022 before the patient got admitted. So in this chest x-ray we can see that uh, there was uh, no significant abnormality in the bilateral lung fields. The mediastinum was also normal and the bilateral CP angles were also free. There was no evidence of any pleural effusion also. Then a CCT chest and abdomen was done on 12th November 2022 when the patient was admitted under medicine. In this we can see that the, in the chest the mediastinum was fine, however in the abdomen we could see moderate hepatosplenomegaly with multiple infarcts in the spree. There was no ascites and in the lung fields also we could not see any evidence of any uh, infection or any other abnormality. Then subsequently after the patient got admitted in hematology and started developing further symptoms, the CCT chest and abdomen was repeated and in this we can see that there was development of bilateral pleural fusion, left more than right. There was also a, a presence of a left uh, prevascular uh, lymph node that was seen in the chest. In the abdomen, we could see that the moderate hepatosplenomegaly was persistent. However, the splenic infarcts had increased in number as well as size. Ascites had also developed and in the lung fields, we could see that there was evidence of mild uh, interlobular septal thickening, which in combination with the subcutaneous edema led us to think of a possibility of a volume overload-like uh, condition or a condition which led to interstitial fluid accumulation like hyperproteinemia. Subsequently, the chest X-ray done on 15 December 2022 showed that the pleural effusion had increased. So there was left uh, sided pleural effusion which was gross and led to passive atelectasis of the left lung. There was mediastinal shift to the right as well. A HRCT was done on 4 January 2023 which showed the gross left sided pleural effusion with passive collapse of almost the entire left lung. We can see that the hepatosplenomegaly had reduced by this stage and the splenic infarcts had also reduced. However, there was this development of nodular kind of thickening of the diaphragmatic pleura. 
also there was a development of this multiple nodules in the right lung with surrounding ggos which led us to think of a possibility of active infection either bacterial or fungal the diaphragmatic pleural thickening that could be secondary to either a intervention like pleural tap or just hemorrhage within the pleura secondary to any intervention there was also a remote possibility of the pleural involvement by the aml leading to this uh, development of significant pleural effusion and pleural thickening this was the last HRCT that was done post ICD insertion, where we see that the uh, left sided gross pleural effusion has significantly reduced with the reinflation of the left sided lung. There was still passive atelectasis of the left lingular segment. However, in the uh, lung fields, we saw that the uh, nodules that were present in the previous scan were still persistent. The mild pleural thickening that we could see in the diaphragmatic pleura that was also persistent. However, the hepatosplenomegaly had reduced by this uh, stage and the splenic infarcts had also reduced. So this is the comparative evaluation of the scans of different stages where we can see the development of left-sided pleural effusion with mild pleural effusion on the right side as well and resolution after insertion of uh, intercostal tube drainage. The hepatosplenomegaly had increased uh, initially however that got resolved after initiation of treatment and the splenic infarcts had also reduced with the persistence of this a mild pleural thickening on the left side. I'll uh, invite Dr. Tipeka to discuss the rest of the case. So for etiology of pleural effusion, uh, uh, we did pleural fluid culture which was negative. It was a low ADA exudative fluid. The cytology for any malignant cell was negative. Thus AML, AML infiltration was ruled out. We did a thoracoscopy on 11th of Jan which showed extensive adhesion with diffusely thickened pleura at places and a histopathological examination after taking biopsy from these thickened sites was done which showed fibroblastic proliferation with fibrosis and there were no atypical cells suggesting that it was just a part of spectrum of eosinophilic disease. So points of discussion of in this case is uh, first we will discuss definition of uh, hyper eosinophilia and hyper eosinophilic syndrome, clinical manifestations of same, how to approach hyper eosinophilia and lastly this special category myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with eosinophilia and tyrosine kinase gene fusion. So hyper eosinophilia is when your absolute eosinophil count is more than 1500 on two occasions which are at least four weeks apart without any end organ damage. It is just hyper eosinophilia. When this hyper eosinophilia is associated with any end organ damage, it is called hyper eosinophilic syndrome. The term primary hyper eosinophilia is reserved when eosinophils are clonal in nature due to some underlying stem cell myeloid or eosinophilic neoplasm, whereas secondary eosinophilia is when some underlying condition causes reactive increase in eosinophils which are non-clonal. Uh, regardless of the cause of uh, uh, eosinophilia, virtually any system can be infiltrated by eosinophils. Most important among them is the cardiovascular system which is the most important cause, most common cause of mortality among these people. It, this hyper eosinophilia can cause endomyocardial myocardial fibrosis, uh, myocarditis, it can cause valvular uh, dysfunction, it can, can cause restrictive cardiomyopathy. Second important organ which is involved is pulmonary system, it can cause pulmonary fibrosis, pleural effusion, sometimes pulmonary embolism. Uh, in nervous system, it can cause stroke, it can cause TIA or neuropathy. In uh, hepatic system, it can cause bud carry syndrome, it can cause eosinophilic cholangitis presenting as jaundice, it can cause hepatitis. Uh, in fact, it can involve any system of the body. So how to approach hyper eosinophilia? When a patient presents with hyper eosinophilia and his uh, absolute eosinophil count is more than 1500 on two separate occasions, four weeks apart, then First, rule out the secondary causes of hyper eosinophilia. You have to rule out infection, allergies, some medication which can cause hyper eosinophilia. Rule out underlying collagen vascular disease or autoimmune disease. Rule out any solid tumor or lymphoma which is lying in the body which is causing hyper eosinophilia. Because to treat hyper eosinophilia in this case, you have to treat the underlying cause. While you are evaluating for these secondary causes, 
assess for end organ damage because it is the end organ damage which will cause the mortality of the patient before you can reach the diagnosis and the most important among this is cardiac functions go for trop t trop i lever do a ecg do a eco because if cardiac system is involved even if you don't have a diagnosis you should promptly start steroids because it will save the patient's life you can uh, to evaluate pulmonary system you can go ahead with imaging techniques pulmonary function test to evaluate nervous system you can do nerve conduction study or you can go for tissue biopsy but if you are having a life threatening end organ involvement don't wait for the diagnosis Tra start treatment with steroids upfront once you have ruled out secondary causes of hyper eosinophilia so what we are left with is to uh, get to uh, is clonal eosinophilias and to uh, arrive at a diagnosis go ahead with blood and bone marrow examination in blood examination you can look for cytopenias dysplasias blast you, on bone marrow fibrosis you can look for blast exact blast percentage bone marrow fibrosis dysplasia you can do molecular test certain mutations which are associated with eosinophilia and myeloid neoplasm with eosinophilia they have this typical characteristic they are uh, associated with elevated serum vitamin b12 level and serum tryptase level so myeloid blast crisis which evolve uh, which have this P, uh, fip1 l1 pdgfr alpha fusions they are very rare and the incidence is uh, which is reported is less than 1% and there are only few case reports or case series which has uh, defined this entity that is myeloid blast crisis with patient with this fusions so the exact incidence is very low it is less than one and there are no last large case series for this but this group it has got a special category in 2022 who and icc classification not because they are very rare but because once you have this diagnosis you have a targeted therapy by which you can change the course of treatment the patient which was initially untreatable now with imatinib the patient has longer life expectancy that is why this group has got a separate entity in new who classification and these neoplasm they can present with a range of morphological types they can mostly present with mpns they can present with mds mds mpn overlap syndromes or rarely as acute leukemias so what we know about pd gfr a fusions first thing is male predominance male to female ratio is 17 is to 1 mostly the patient present between 25 to 55 years of age it is the most common cause of myeloid lymphoid neoplasm with tyrosine kinase gene fusion more than 90% of the patient will have peripheral blood eosinophilia and the other thing is chronic eosinophilic uh, leukemia like picture with the extra medullary involvement it is very common with these fusion genes and one thing which should be kept in mind is these fusion genes they cannot be identified by standard cytogenetics you have to use either rtpcr or fish to detect these mutation because these are cryptic mutations they can present with eosinophilia splenomegaly mpn phenotype but as aml and all also they can present uh, as far as histopathological findings are concerned what we see is there is increased bone marrow, marrow cellularity in these cases there is extensive myelofibrosis there is increase in atypical mast cells now comes the interesting part that is the treatment of pdgfra uh, rearranged uh, uh, leukemias it has excellent prognosis with imatinib prior to the imatinib the overall survival was just 9 months but now the 5 year overall survival it is more than 80% to not reached depending on the series and the patient they can be treated with very do low doses of imatinib because this fusion is very sensitive to imatinib the dose which we use in cml is 400 mg but it is seen that even 100 mg of imatinib is very effective in achieving remission in these patients with pdgfr fusions and some have reported that once weekly uh, dose it is able to maintain complete molecular response acquired or primary resistance 
to uh, resistance mutation to imatinib in these scenarios it is very rare with only few uh, cases which are documented one of the mutation is this t674i it is resistant to imatinib but what uh, uh, various uh, institution have tried is they have tried sorafenib or midostorin which is again a targeted therapy with modest results and the other one the notorious d842v mutation it is resistant to all uh, tkis it is sensitive only to ponatinib so if an unfortunate patient has these two mutation we can try instead of imatinib we can uh, try different targeted agents uh, we went uh, we consulted literature and we uh, uh, retrospectively uh, looked what was wrong with our treatment when we initially treated the patient with venetoclax and hypomethylating agents because elderly frail patients with aml usually they do do very good with this combination and blast clearance is uh, achieved easily but when we reviewed this paper uh, it uh, it was revealed that venetoclax plus hypomethylating agent like as a cited in it is not effective in blast phase of mpns because in blast phase of mpns there is increased expression of mcl1 and there is decreased bcl2 expression which is the main target target of venetoclax current status of the patient he achieved remission with this imatinib therapy he is now doing fine he is on imatinib 400 mg he is back to his work and on regular follow up visit so the take home message is every hyper eosinophilia has a story so accurate classification is mandatory uh, hyper eosinophilia needs multiple clinical and lab in investigation to arrive at a correct diagnosis keep a low threshold for bone marrow examination uh, uh, if you feel the patient is having dysplasia, some decreased blood counts or you are not getting any diagnosis, all the secondary causes are ruled out, go ahead with bone marrow examination. Higher eosinophil count, particularly who are poor responder to steroids, it may suggest, suggest a malignant disease versus a low level which is mostly found in secondary causes and they are sort of extremely sensitive to steroids. PDGFRA rearrangement are missed on conventional karyotyping. You have to do fish for chick to deletion for diagnosis, otherwise, you are going to miss this uh, uh, fusion. And tyrosine kinase fusion driven myeloid neoplasm should not be missed. Their diagnosis, though rare, should be made because they are extremely sensitive to TKI. And after diagnosis, you can change the prognosis of the patient completely. Thank you. Thank you uh, for finishing on time, succinct and lucid presentation. We have some time for questions. If there are any questions, we are more than happy to take them. Yes, please. Yes. So, so your question is that whether a skin biopsy can glitch that yes. So hyper eosinophilia can be in the blood or it can be in the tissue. Skin manifestations can be either because of the reactive cytokines that are released from the eosinophils or they may show a clonal population or skin infiltration. So depending on the cause. We can may be possible to make a diagnosis if there is extensive infiltration of eosinophils, but it would not be a standalone diagnosis, it might more lead to further. <coughs> so, if there are no further questions, we can move on to the second. Good afternoon all. 
This is a presentation from the Department of Otolaryngology, but it's really a triumph of collaborative medicine. It is really one of those occasions where I certainly feel a great amount of pride in the institution I work in, and also count the blessings of working with such competent colleagues, competent and committed colleagues. So this was a patient with uh, congenital high airway obstruction, a child who was certain to die when he got when he was born, and uh, Though we have had some experience with this in the past, all of us in this team, and obviously all of us in this team had something to contribute to this situation. So anesthesia, radiology, peak surgery, peeps, us, ops and gynae, of course. Um, I would also say that a lot of the credit for a good outcome actually goes to the family because it's very easy for the family to lose hope and lose out in these kind of situations. But this is one situation wherein uh, we as professionals did well and one situation wherein the family gave such tremendous uh, commitment uh, that we have a great outcome for a young child who is now up and about uh, breathing, speaking, swallowing and it's a greatly satisfying outcome. So what we'll do, we'll have radiology present the problem and then uh, Dr. Abhinash Jaiswal will present uh, as to how we would treat it. We will do have a composite presentation with all with with with, uh, with a synopsis of what all specialties did out there, and then we'll try and have comments from everybody. So, a very good afternoon to all. Uh, we received this uh, MRI which was done outside for review and it was a term pregnancy 36 weeks and uh, the antenatal diagnosis was uh, there was a twin pregnancy as we can so, uh, see that uh, the twin pregnancy has been marked. There is a presenting twin which is in cephalic presentation and there is an after coming twin where we can see that the after coming twin is in the breech presentation. This is the head of the fetus. So. Now here we can see that uh, this is the fluid filled trachea, here we can see this is the sagittal view, so this is the fluid filled trachea, this is a coronal view of the chest of the after coming twin, so these lungs are uh, hyperinflated, there is increased intensity of the lungs and there is a flattening of the hemidiaphragm. In addition we can see that the trachea and the bronchi are fluid filled and distended, so there is a likely obstruction in the upper airway. The exact site of the obstruction is difficult to comment on an antenatal MR, but there is an indirect evidence that there is obstruction in the upper airway, which is leading to fluid uh, distension of the lungs with fluid along with secretions within the trachea and the bronchi. So this is suggestive of a congenital high airway obstruction in the aftercoming twin. Uh, so we, we have come to know about the problem. Uh, from the patient's perspective, it was a valuable pregnancy. The lady was a 44-year-old primary gravida. She, had, she has had infertility for around 15 years. This was an IVF conception with a donor oocyte. And the lady also had a beta thalassemia trait with a hypothyroidism. This, this was a diamnionic and dichorionic twins. And there was an ascites and chaos in second twin. So we did a karyosynthesis, amniocentesis to check for the karyotypes. The karyotypes was normal. The option of selective fetal reduction was considered, but uh, since there was a risk to the first twin, as well as the heart of the second twin was inaccessible because of the O-inflated lungs, so we had gone away with this option. So we found a multidisciplinary team which was involved for the delivery. The plan was for an elective LSCS under general anesthesia, so as to give a uterine relaxation and prolong the utero uh, placenta circulation to the fetus. The procedure of exit was planned, ex utero intrapartum treatment. The mock grill was done involving all the teams as a routine. The first uh, twin which had a cephalic presentation was born limp and apneic with intact pods. It was intubated, observed and extubated after about 7 minutes to room air. Then the second twin which was born with a breech presentation. Uh, this was an intubation attempt. It was born limp and apneic. The intubation was attempted. As you can see that uh, we tried to intubate the tube but uh, 
there was failure with uh, intuition which was attempted twice we could not uh, enter the glottis only hence uh, we did the bronchoscopy and uh, in the bronchoscopy we tried to create a passage but uh, on uh, attempted bronchoscopy there was release of uh, this uh, fluid under pressure from the uh, glottic uh, and the tracheal lumen but however the bronchoscopy was also not successful in intubating the kid this we can see that uh, the fluid which was present under pressure in the trachea was released however the intubation was not uh, the bronchoscopy was not successful so we went ahead with the tracheostomy and a 2.5 mm tracheostomy tube was secured the saturation of the uh, baby improved from 10% at 6 minutes to 66% at 7 minutes and uh, at which time the cord clamping was done his abgar score improved from the her abgar score improved from 1 to 8 from at 1 minute to 10 minutes the uh, baby required neck stiff and required oxygen support for the first 20 hours of life the respiratory parameters were stabilized once the respiratory parameters were stabilized uh, we did a five optic evaluation of the upper airway however we could only visualize that the epiglottis and was normal and bilateral atmoids were mobile we could not evaluate the vocal folds and subglottis which was a secretion so we did an ncct neck and there was suspicion of a small segment subglottic stenosis the child was taken to a theater once uh, the systemic parameters were stabilized at uh, 20 weeks of age we did a dl direct laryngoscopic evaluation we found that the there was presence of anterior glottic web with a grade 4 short segment subglottic stenosis So what we did was we did a laser release of the glottic web to uh, and uh, we did a laryngotracheal reconstruction this was from the trans cervical approach we did an anterior required split we did a split of the posterior required cartilage and harvested rib from the harvested uh, posterior cartilage from the rib and used those cartilages to augment the anterior and posterior required and uh, the stenting of the airway was done using a nasotracheal tube for around 2 weeks we went ahead with close of the tracheostomy during the procedure after around 2 weeks the child developed low respiratory tract infection which was managed with antibiotics and we planned to extubate the child in the operating theater this was the endoscopy which was done post extubation which revealed an adequate glottic and subglottic airway however uh, post extubation after 12 hours the child developed tachypnea we went ahead with management with uh, medical management of the condition however the tachypnea was progressive and the child was non responsive to medical management by the third day the child was developing impending respiratory failure so he had to be the she had to be reintubated and uh, we took the child to operation theater twice we did a direct laryngoscopy and found that glottic stenosis where we did a balloon dilatation and the child was intubated for four days and uh, endotracheal tube was kept as stent our post extubation see again developed respiratory distress and see again had to be reintubated uh, in spite of the normal glottic and subglottic airway uh, since he was developing respiratory distress so we went ahead with the bronchoscopy we did a flexible bronchoscopy of the kid which revealed that uh, there was glottic narrowing but uh, more more than glottic narrowing there was presence of a tracheal bronchomalacia so uh, we decided as a team to do a revision tracheostomy and uh, do a watchful waiting for the for the uh, tracheal bronchomalacia to resolve it was decided to plan for a 6 monthly serial bronchoscopy at uh, around 6 uh, months uh, of the discharge we did a bronchoscopy which revealed that the tracheal tracheal and cranial diameters were normal but the range in it was normal or uh, narrow and uh, after serial bronchoscopy at 6 months we found that there was fusion of the vocal cords with a very narrow posterior glottic opening and there was scarring in the right bronchus intermedius at this time the child was lost to follow up due to covid so the next bronchoscopy we could only only after around a year or so this revealed that uh, there was near complete glottic stenosis however the prominent top trachea and carina were normal the child had again to be uh, taken to ot so we did a radiology of the neck this revealed that there was narrowing at the glottic level however the subglottic diameter appeared fair so we did a direct laryngoscopy evaluation which revealed a complete glottic scar and there was clicking mobility of the cords 
so we did a glottic scar release and a left laser cordotomy. The glottic area was dilated using balloons and a topical mitomycin C was applied. Post procedure, we did an endoscopy and we found that the area was adequate. And in the post operative period, we did we tried to cock the tube and this she tolerated well for a month. But after about a month, her, day, her parents complained that she had occasional respiratory difficulty with caulking and she could not tolerate the caulking. So we did a fiber optic laryngeal evaluation at five years of age. This you can see that this revealed the bilateral cords are mobile epiglottis are normal, but there was presence of this anterior glottic web and the posterior glottic area was narrow. So this was a final intervention which we did. This evaluation revealed a glottic scar which was uh, released with a CO2 laser. We found that the posterior glottic area was normal and the subglottic area was found to be normal. However, we, there was suspicion of a mild collapse of the right side posterior wall of the mid trachea below the stoma on negative pressure. So we did a bronchoscopy in a weak position which revealed that there was minimal tracheal militia. This was the endoscopy which uh, was done post procedure which revealed a normal subglottic airway. This was the part of the upper trachea and uh, this is the glottic lumen which was there which which revealed, which was found to be adequate for the situation. So we caught the patient and uh, this sit tolerated well and the strapping has been done. Patient has been decandulated. She is uh, eating, speaking. Uh, her language was not very well developed so she has been <laughs> training for her language right now. She is able to vocalize. Now this is all from my side. I request Dr. Uh, Professor Alok sir for comments. So you could actually, I will just an upside, you could look at four phases as to how this patient uh, has been over the past six, seven years. Um, first phase was of course the diagnosis uh, that she had chaos and something needed to be done when she was born and all the challenges that come after you do the, uh, after you secure the airway because these uh, children have issues with alveolar maldevelopment and issues that we will be told off by Dr. Ramesh Agarwal there. Phase two was a surgical intervention at the age of six months to recreate the airway. Phase two was disappointing because after we did it and found something that looked absolutely wonderful, the child nevertheless could not quite breathe after extubation. And it was then discovered that she also had coexistent tracheobronchomalacia, which also is associated with this situation because their trachea has actually been dilated by the fluid which was there in the in the in the prenatal phase, phase three was waiting for the tracheobronchomalacia to settle as the child got older and supporting it mean the while via tracheostomy, and phase four was coming back to sort the larynx and the airway uh, to to get the child back to normal airway. So. Uh, I think it would be best if at this stage all of us can individually come down and speak about the challenges that they have faced and uh, perhaps appropriate to go in a fairly circular way. I don't know. So, Austin Danny wants to come first. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. A good example of teamwork and we've had a couple of babies with the cures here whenever did exit for them. So this lady was like already said 42 years old, IV pregnancy, twin, referred after a normally scan with ecogenic enlarged lungs and they were referred for, uh, from my, one of my colleagues for fetal reduction. So technically it was difficult because of the crowding in the uterus, it was already around 20-22 weeks, we attempted once. So we couldn't uh, achieve it, then we said, okay, carry on with the pregnancy and they didn't want to take another uh, intervention. And then she was lost to follow up and came almost around 34, 35 weeks. So when we did the scan, the picture had changed. 
so their lungs were not that ecogenic that they looked and big they looked earlier so we were a little in a dilemma that what has happened is it disappeared or like how do we recognize which baby is affected because of the twins and how to plan for the delivery so the mri was done and then it was found that the second baby the one who was breached had this problem maybe some fistula developed in utero and you know the thing partly got corrected in the ultrasound features were not typical of chaos then again at the time of delivery the problem like the first baby was normal but we thought we will be doubly sure and make sure that the first also has a patent airway so the first one was incubated extubated then we deliver the next one i believe we prefer an exit to deliver the head of the baby neck secure an airway and then then deliver the whole baby because this was a breach we had to deliver the baby and then the airway was secured but that was pretty quick it did take much time then the challenge of pph so this patient had a little excessive bleeding required blood transfusion but uh, generally uh, did well so i think congratulations the baby is doing well yeah thanks you too I think uh, for us there are two challenges that we uh, encounter. Uh, one is at the time of birth, and uh, you can just imagine we have just one minute, and we have to do a lot of activities during that small period. so the team has to go there in that crowded place where you have ob team anesthesia team and ent team also on standby so the team has to provide uh, initial steps post operation ventilation and then attempting intubation and making sure you know being sure that we are truly failing and it's not a technique issue because sometimes you find that it was not there so within a minute then you have to give uh, way to the ent team and then they come into the picture and then they carry out the tracheostomy while the baby is still on the placenta and i'm like but sometimes that oxygenation may not be sufficient and the baby can develop complications like arrest and then you may have to carry out cardiac pulmonary resuscitation so lot of activities and since it required lot of coordination also so we do lot of mock drills so that during that time everything goes as it is planned so everyone is clear that what is they are supposed to do and what is they are, are supposed not to do and then uh, i mean this particular thing then is followed by a long journey and five months in this particular case and then there were many ups and downs and managing the chaos with you man small baby and sometimes the uh, right kind of tube is not available and when you put it there then it goes too far in and uh, transporting the baby with uh, uh, one place to the other so and then uh, long term ventilation and there are many other issues so ups and downs and we managed that with uh, help of uh, ent colleagues and uh, um, you know after that also post discharge the baby required huge amount of support managing the chaosme lung conditions nutrition neurodevelopment etc i think uh, i'm happy and uh, you know recently we managed another case unfortunately we lost the child at age of four days five days neck mass and then exit was done baby transported and then at one point the tube got the baby got decannulated and it took time to recannulate it by the time the game was lost thank you
perfect position, they thought of a position in the confined space. And the child, uh, in that case, first case, uh, survived in about four to six months and um, developed senescence. Subsequently, there were series of cases, cervical facial teratoma. Uh, this was, of course, a successful one. Uh, so, this was the message that I was supposed to transfer onto the crowd. This is not my experience. The challenge being the technique, uh, the surgically, it's not a challenge. It's about uh, maintaining coordination and maintaining the timing as the doctor has made those. So as Anastasia brought this, I think uh, we may have more than almost all the cases of uh, the management of this patient. So talking about the exit procedure per se, uh, there is one the anesthetic management of the mother, and then the anesthetic management of the fetus plus minus airway management. So where the mother is concerned, I think there are two important interventions which primarily can lead to a successful outcome in the exit surgery. One is profound uterine relaxation, which is very contrary to the routine management of the section where you don't want this. Right? And secondly, maintain the uterine density. So, uh, what, how we do that is by giving high concentration of volatile anesthetic agents, which relaxes the uterus, or we use IV Here, I think we use the combination of so as a consequence of the high concentration of volatile agents or IV <coughs> there is the adverse effect of hypertension. So hypertension can lead to a uh, decrease in the little present perfusion. So to prevent that, we use a prophylactic infusion of benign. So that the maternal hemodynamics uh, dynamics are optimized and there is no uh, compromise to the little present. So here also a fidelity uh, infusion was started. I was not there, Dr. Rajeshi was there. She was not here, so I'm kind of conveying uh, this message on her behalf. She, and uh, for the fetal management, Dr. Demu was there, so she could talk about that. So this was the obstetric management. And uh, the, side, the side effect of the profound time relaxation caused by the volatile anesthetics at MPG is that later on, once the baby is out, there is increased incidence of postpartum injury. So we have to be prepared for that also with the oxygen. So that's a side effect. And uh, following that, I think the uh, definitive airway surgery, multiple sittings, the challenges of managing a pediatric patient, a neonate patient, a neonatal patient, and uh, the, the challenge of shared airway with the MP, all those are obviously. So what the Thank you, sir, for the the three exit procedures along with all the team, including Dr. Pastra, Dr. Pranna, Dr. Hallo. And one day I remember that once I was doing intubation through video laryngoscopy, and one person was standing in front of the monitor. Dr. Hallo said, So this is the chaos which happens in the OT because of so many persons who are there. And anesthetist is that anchor who helped at every place. They know the gynecologist, they know the radiologist, they are surgeon, they are good, they are patient, and also the ALD person. So in this case, first thing there are twin pregnancies. So first of all, it was said that the second baby had the problem. So first baby will not have any problem. But then there was confusion. So we thought that once the first baby will be born, we will intubate. If it, we will be able to intubate that baby, and the cord will be cut, and then after that the second baby will be taken. So at that point of time, we had three anesthesia, dealing with three anesthesia machines also. One for the patient, one for the first fetus, and first, second for the second fetus. And there is my own also, so the things were quite uh, risky and quite haywire, but it was managed successfully. First intubation, in that body part was visible, and the epidemiologist was also visible, but the tube was not there. And after that, Dr. Kalo did Bronchoscopy first with the one bronchoscopy and then the smaller one. But after that, the diagnostic was done. And with, again, as Dr. Vibhu said, multiple anesthesia exposures for the pain and anesthetic pain was always there. And so, so if yes. the patient is intubated, then the things are very uh, calmly can be done. If the mass is there, that can be removed surgically. So at that point of time, if there is surgical. If there is a mask and another existent OT is also prepared for the surgery, if required. 
Professor Kavra, sir. Because ultimately, even though we had sorted the patient, we thought. We thought we had sorted the patient. The patient still wasn't breathing, and Dr. Kavra then did the dynamic flexible bronchoscopy and diagnosed why the patient was still having problems. Yeah, so our team in neurochirurgy worked very hard for five months. And then when you are discharged the open problems, because of, uh, say, upper airway obstruction, you are both dynamic as well as fixed. And that will cause, and there was a request to me. So it will cause a feeding problem as well as the infection. And then you have to maintain the nutrition, treat the infection, and then regular follow-up. And as uh, Dr. Alo, who dealing with such activities, family and parental support was the major issue that they would come to us Every 15 days, 20 days for uh, some increasing of feeding problem, vomitings, and uh, any of the technology. So the whole team was very hard. And the success is that uh, I saw this uh, probably two months ago. Probably. And uh, then she had a near normal development. So though it was a very labor intensive, so many people go back. So we are happy that the child is uh, having a almost normal disorder. Uh, and major issue was support for nutrition as well as taking care of the infection. Thank you. So just to put it in context, in 2009 when we did our first case, I didn't know what exit was, I didn't know what chaos was. I had a very young consultant, Ramesh Agarwal, who I met on the stair and he introduced me to what was exit and what was chaos. And we did the procedure the same afternoon without anesthesia because it was a term vaginal delivery. That was when I got educated. Sandeep Agarwala was brilliant in organizing it and telling me what to do. I did what a technician does, but he told us what to do. We got it all organized. And uh, we have now done five, and we have done as many near misses, so to say, or good situations, wherein we went prepared to do an exit, but finally we did intubate the child, all credit to Dr. Renu there. So we have come so far, but the reality is, only one of them has survived long term. This is this child. And if you look at the literature, it's not very different. I just reviewed some literature from Korea, which is very contemporary. In 2009, less than 10% were surviving long term. Today, they had a series of 30 patients compiled from all over the world. And they said that 10 had finally had surgery, 6 were swallowing, 2 were speaking. So it's not easy because there's so many other issues with them, so many other issues with them. But this institution can solve it. Certainly we have a big panel for you to ask questions. Maybe we can just speak to ourselves and ask each other questions. So thank you.